It's like a war movie. But in reality, when the shells are flying and mines are exploding, it is very breathtaking and very scary. I'm not a fearful person, but when this happens, fear appears instinctively, without consciousness. Hands and feet are shaking, the heart is pounding. Don't sing, don't sing. We'll tell a story about the war. What did you say when the mines were exploding? How did you say it? Bang bang? We can say that from the very first days, we saw all the groupings that shook the earth, including the house and everything around. I woke up and something exploded. I got off the bed and said, the war started. It is very scary. It feels like a dream that you can't wake up from. I was walking my dog when the shelling started and rockets started flying. The windows were shaking. You could actually hear the windows shaking from the explosions. The first bomb exploded in my house. There was a whole battery on the shore there, and they were bombing here for two weeks. They promised us that they would not touch us. After a while, the house was destroyed by them. It was helicopters and grad, MLRS systems, and airplanes. Relatives from Abukhiv, from Kyiv, filed a wanted list and posted photos because they couldn't find us. Look at the shrapno flying. It was horrible. We were frozen by the fact that we could not get water normally because there was a sniper in the village council and on the roof of the school and we weren't around like that. I always had me and my children's clothes ready here. I put them in piles like this. And if they started bombing heavily, I would grab my kids' things and run into the bathroom. We dressed, but sometimes did not get dressed at all and ran naked and barefoot to the cellar. I was scared, very scared. Well, I had some kind of connection, but somehow managed to hold on. And then the connection was lost. I knew that my father left or was rather taken away. And I don't know where he is or what he's doing. I have a sister near Hostomel in the forest by Busha. Where is she? It was dark, there was no reception, no light. And you couldn't turn on flashlights or light anything because they said if they saw any light in the house, they would throw bombs at the houses. Okay. 
I was chopping wood and cutting wood in the cellar. We could hear the shells flying. That shells were like squealing. But after the window fell out and the lid closed over me, and it hit me like that, I saw my whole life before me in just a minute. It sounded like this. And what were you doing when it exploded? I was hiding in the cellar. We cleaned up all the potatoes here, moved them there, put them on the shelves. We put them on different mattresses and accommodated 11 people here and slept here and spent the day and night here. The food was here. It's so scary to remember, of course. God forbid, but the cellar is strong. My grandfather had done his best. There are good cellars in apartment buildings, buildings that fit 30 to 50 people at a time. And you can cook on the fire outside. Well, it happened that we were sitting for a day. At minus 12 degrees Celsius, then it snowed so much and we were naked we were running barefoot, and I had this sweatshirt here, and it had, I had a hat, gloves, and socks. And I was always walking like a kangaroo. You're asleep, and there's an explosion. You have to run to the cellar. The children run naked and barefoot, and we had no light. So you know that you have to have it with you, and then you start to wear it. Perhaps it's easier for the villagers. But we missed the bread. We didn't eat any bread for 37 days. We didn't even see it. Somebody gave a small piece of bread to my mother. They gave us one piece. My mother cut it into such cubes. She would give it to our son, Yevhen, one cube. She gave him one piece of bread, one cube a day. I had some potatoes left in the cellar and some carrots and beets, some bread. And that is what we had to eat. It's good that there is food in the village. Neighbors would visit each other, bring each other things. We would cook something and give it to the children and the neighbors would help us with it. There are old people, they were also carried by neighbors. There are guys from the village. I want to say thank you very much from the whole village. Rescuing people all over the village. Four men who share the meat, who share the flour, who share the sugar, who share the medicine. There was an opportunity to take oil, and we literally had two minutes to run across the road to where they were traveling. They would shoot everyone who ran away, and we would stick our heads out like that. We were running. I, I don't know how to express it. Anyway, we got there, we took the sunflower oil, but when we were walking back, the column started to go. Sergei says, hi, the convoy is coming. In short, you run back behind that fence hiding. In this, in the 21st century, it's just not possible. They took us under this fence and 
beat us, took all our documents. We were beaten along this street by two occupiers with machine guns. They took us down there, and that's where their headquarters were. And in this car, the driver was shot. He was lying on the steering wheel. They shot him directly. We have a market there, and our uncle, a man, he's a watchman there. I ask him, what do you eat there? And he says, I've been eating apples for six days now. My son and I packed two bags of food and carried them to him. And it was those Rashists who kidnapped us. And they asked, why have you such unknown calls on your phone? There were some people, but they went away. Where exactly? I'm saying, I don't know. And they didn't tell me where they were going. There was some kind of equipment in the car. And they were putting my phone under the equipment and reading everything. Whom did I call? They kept me and my son on our knees, but thank God they let us go. They asked me where the Nazis and where Stepan Bandara was. And I said, are you kidding me? I told them they should study history. And they asked, are you really that smart? At about 12 o'clock at night, we were all put on our knees in the basement and shown a flashlight, and my friend was led outside. We could hear machine gun bursts. I kept asking them to let go of the children, even the little ones. That boy was sitting out there, maybe 11 years old, and I kept saying, take me, let go of the children. I was sleeping at 3 a.m. and they shot the lock. They are breaking through the windows and entering the house. They broke the window and I was sitting there, saying to the boys, what did they want? Who was there? Grandma, we're going to see. And they went forth through the rooms with the machine gun, opened the cabinets, broke everything, and then told me, close everything. It was a tank just after we were leaving. They wanted to shoot an old woman near the tank. And one of them said, Nah, the old guy, we don't need it. They had already shot three people on the neighboring street. One of our uncles was wounded, and we were helping him. His leg was wounded on the neighboring street, Vatuna Street, parallel to ours. A young man, Maxim, was killed there. Woman and man were shot, and their children were left orphaned. As Russian troops entered, there was a lot of equipment, more than 1,500 armored personnel carriers. They were driving around and shooting at everything they saw with assault rifles. Two of our fellow villagers were shot at this very spot. A young boy of 25 years old was also shot. We approached probably 50 meters away. And they saw us and they had machine guns. I raised my hands like this and said, my child is lying there wounded. I wanted to take him away. And he said, wounded? There's a body lying there. Is it yours? I said, that's my child. We were walking past all these bastards. And he says, here, he's lying. And his body's lying there so poor, twisted like that. And his skin was black, covered with soot. At first we were afraid of the vehicles when they were driving. Then we were afraid that they were shooting bombs somewhere because it was far away. But when they came to our yard, it was very scary.
We had a mattress and we were sitting on it like this. Me and Serhe, Zhenya, Nastya, Nazar. My mother-in-law was sitting in the house. They came and started knocking on the door. Open the door, lady. Open it up. We'll just see. Where it was closed, they broke the doors and windows. It was very scary to wait for them to come to you with a machine gun. But first he reloaded it, then came down and opened the curtain with the muzzle. And I was sitting under the wall and was like, and I'm panicking. We all put our hands up and we all cried. Just like that, it hit you. I died when they pointed their guns at me, when they said, come out then, my life is over. I said, put the gun down, the child will be coming out now. One of them did, and the other half turned around, but still anyway, holding the guns, and we left. I said, what are you looking for here? They answered, Nazis. The door's open and I'm at the threshold. And I just walked in and I was at the door. They open the door and six people are standing there with guns pointed at me like this. And they pointed the guns at me. They wanted our soldiers and asked, who do you have? And I said, we have five pensioners. I told them that there were two men in that entrance. And they said they did not come to us. And there's no one here but us. We were not informed. We didn't know anything about the atrocities in Busha. We didn't know what was going on in the center of Borodyanka. We didn't know anything about it. Our street is a little bit on the outskirts, and everything was flying past us. But later, when they let me go home, I was scared. They really let me go. I was alive. In general, this is how they tortured people. Next, there was Katarov's people. They were taken prisoner in a military camp and held in cellars. Then they took three buses to the border with Belarus, where they raped the girls. Taken by families, they were raped, hung, and executed. They already thought they were kings here. And then they set up roadblocks. They started smashing everything. I don't know how we saved ourselves. We had already thought of, well, they had already come up with a hiding place to hide the children. We calculated with my son to the second how long it would take to open the door and to let them in to hide our daughter. We made a space in the sofa to lay them down so they could lie there softly and calculated how many seconds it would take to hide everything so that it would not be noticeable. Of course, it wasn't scary for the girls. They were not allowed to leave the yard. If they went somewhere to visit each other by the gardens of such a place, then they would sit in the cellar. Children would play games by candlelight in the cellar and didn't go out during the day. They destroyed everything. They took everything away. They were looking for meat. And then somewhere they got some alcohol. And they were having fun and singing. My son was killed on March 3rd. Russians? The Russians killed him, the executioners. He was driving his car with his wife. He was shot in the throat and then in the heart. And he lost control of himself somehow. The car caught fire. My daughter-in-law jumped out as the car burned down. Vassal, our brother-in-law, was also tortured for three or four days. He had to leave us to bring cereals, and he disappeared somewhere. He was gone for two weeks or a month, literally a month. 
And then when they came out and he came to us, he told us, when he was leaving us, they took him away, pulled his car by a tank, and took Borodyanka, where they broke his ribs and broke his arms. They were shooting at everyone's cars, like theirs, for example. A car was driving by and they shot at it. That's where hurricanes and grads, the MLRS system stood. Yes, every day grad bombs were fired. We came out of the yard and watched the cassette being shot. I personally recorded 14 seconds of flying and then explosions. I personally survived two shellings with Graz and two mortar attacks with my family. During the shelling, my fence was cut and shattered. The neighboring houses burned down and were broken by the shelling. A shell came into the yard. It buried in the ground and did not explode. When they bombed us on the last day, we were saying goodbye to our lives. Five people in the hallway, and that's it. We thought that we were not going to survive. We were done. We regretted staying because the children were on the verge of death. And my wife was already hysterical about the children because they bombed and bombed everything and there's nothing left. Children lived here. Almost 50 children were educated here. It was nice, it was clean. As you can see, there were no military or strategic objects. They bombed our work. Thank God they were taken out before all this horror. They were taken abroad and are doing well there. Volunteers came, and I remembered the 15th. And after they came every day, they tried to take us away. They told us to leave. I said, no, I'm not going. That's how I should do it. I think that if I don't leave, no one will think about us. And then when the police brought us food, and volunteers brought us food, and everyone started to bring us food. God, they haven't forgotten about us. I thought they would forget, but I was only lost in my own thoughts. Thanks to everyone who cares about us. And yet they agitated me to go to Moscow, saying, you are such a woman, why are you here? Why don't you leave? I said, why should I leave? This is where I was born. Well, then to Rostov. And there? What am I supposed to do? I say, I'm at home. Well, as the first ones came and said, you live so well in Ukraine. And I said, what? Who doesn't give you money? Your relatives don't give you money? Go earn money, save every penny, damn it. I built that cellar with my children in my own hands. Every brick was laid by me and my children. 
You have such villages and asphalt and electricity and internet and water in the villages. They don't have this. It's a pity to hit such villages. Now we understand what you're fighting for. You have plasma TV in every house. You have toilets in your houses. They were shocked that private houses have toilets and bathrooms. It's scary, it's horrible, you can't imagine anything worse. It just leaves such a mark on the psyche. You can't think of anything worse. I stammered for a week and couldn't speak after that, totally traumatized. And what kind of person is able to endure all this? And we, thank God, survived it all. We will rebuild, clean up, do something. Children will come back. Our children will return and we will work. I'm sorry for these tears, but I'm getting weak and nervous. There are a lot of people killed, a lot of people tortured. Russia is a terrorist state. What can I say? It's not a war on their part. It's a war when the army is fighting the army. These bastards are fighting civilians, so it's impossible to call them an army. In Erpin, I personally saw cars that were shot up and smashed with the words children written in big letters. When the bastards are fighting the elderly and against children and with pregnant women, this is terrorism. It is important that the world community realizes this. As soon as the world realizes this, the sooner they do, the fewer victims will exist. We will be able to destroy the carrier of this terrorism, meaning Russia. They can only be dealt with in one format, as terrorists, not as politicians, not as with a president, not as a state, but that's how the world communicates with Russia. Busha, Hostomel, Erpin are vivid examples of crimes in this regard. The world has to communicate with Russia as with any other terrorist organization. There is no other language. If they want to ensure security of Europe, and I believe the whole world, Thank you.